of punishment. Yeah. You have another question? Yep. Uh, hierarchy, I would say there's degrees. So, so there's degrees because God is actively pouring out his wrath. So don't think of it as like God's not there. And so it's just kind of like self-contained. God is there in his wrath and in his anger. So he is actively, God is actively punishing the unbeliever. I mean, that's the holiness of God. And when we hear that, I think it shows the culture in which we live. That's kind of jarring. God is actively punishing forever. That's his holiness. Yeah. Is that Danica? Hey, Danica. The lights are just um, these things too. You look much better this way. Yeah, go ahead, Danica. <laughs> I'm sorry. These ladies up here were laughing. Say it again. Danica, that's a great question. So much better than Joe's. So the question is, question is, how does, how does Christ in the matter of hours endure infinite and eternal punishment for sin for us? Okay. Um, so how is that possible? And this is why the incarnation is absolutely essential when it comes to our salvation. So you have now... Christ on the cross representing us, truly man. He's representing us. But the only way someone can exhaust infinite wrath is if they have infinite glory. Okay, so you have Christ now, truly God. Only God can exhaust God's wrath. This is one reason why hell is eternal for the, cre uh, the creature because they can't do it. They can't, in it's, they can't even pay for anything. So the way I understand that then is, is you have Christ able to exhaust that because it matches, it matches the infinite anger is matched by his infinite glory and his infinite holiness. And so that then I think exalts just the grace upon grace of our salvation. The only reason why we're saved is because we have an infinitely glorious savior who actually can in his glory exhaust infinite angry wrath. So, so those in hell don't get closer to salvation the longer punishment goes because they can't, and they, they, they can't exhaust anything. They're a creature. They don't have infant glory. Yeah, it's a good question. Really good question. What else? Other questions? Yes, Diedrich. You look a little unsure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I take no responsibility for anything I said seven years ago. <laughs> everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you're not, yep. um, if you call yourself a Christian universalist, then you've changed to Jesus Christ is, and then you're not believing the word, and if you're not believing the word, you're not believing in Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah, so, um, so the question was, you reject, I'm going to take it in pieces, okay? First piece is, uh, those, there are some Christian universalists, which just simply means that everybody's going to get to heaven, God's wrath will be exhausted, uh, on the unbeliever in, in hell, so they'll get to heaven. And Diedrich said that minimizes Christ. And that's absolutely true. This is just, uh, just combine it with, the, with um, Danica's question. So what that person is saying is th um, the creature can actually exhaust God's wrath, but that's something that only infinite God can do. So if that's true, then that does diminish Christ because Christ only did, just in a shorter period of time, but only did what the creature can do in a longer period of time. Make sense? 
Okay, so that does diminish Christ. Now, the, the next step that you said was, well, then if that diminishes Christ, then that person might not be a true believer or, or definitely isn't a true believer. So I would say this. I would say we can have bad theology, still be a believer. So I wouldn't knee-jerk. I wouldn't knee-jerk for those who would say Christ is the only way to heaven. Um, Christ is the only way, and so, and they kind of like work that into their view of hell. And I wouldn't need you to say they're not Christians, okay? But, but when you probe more, I think you're going to see a lot of issues come out. Now, we have, um, we have uh, very well-known theologians like, um, I think John Stott, right? John Stott was a universalist. I, I'm sorry, no, no, strike that. He was an annihilationist, not a universalist, annihilationist. So, he, so Stott saw that there was an end, um, to, to hell. Now, I would not call into question his, his, I think he was a believer. So you can have bad theology uh, there, but what I would do is I just wouldn't say, ah, it's not a big deal. I would actually probe that because there's a reason why they're going there. And you could maybe kind of peel back the layers and see that there's some faulty, really faulty issues. Yeah, uh, go turn over to, um, we looked at it a couple weeks ago, turn over to uh, th- um, Second John And I want to put that, the, the bad theology, in a context. 2 John 8. 2 John 8, where we are commanded, watch yourselves, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. How do you, um, what is he talking about? Watch yourselves, beware. Well, look at verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ. It's coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So he says, watch yourselves, because if you fall victim to bad theology, you are going to lose Bema seat reward. So, because it's going to affect different things. Um, so I wouldn't knee jerk to unbeliever, but I would be very, very cautious. Yeah, 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 you're welcome. What else? Questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, just like a default, like a quick, just a quick thing. Yeah, yeah. It's when you go to the doctor and they hit it and it's like hit it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a theological term, knee jerk. Yeah, yeah. I was year one of seminary. We needed to, kept spelling it wrong too. Yeah, Mike. When I was a little boy and I did something wrong, I was often spanked for it and I did not want to be spanked. Yeah. This is hatred. Yes, yeah. So this, the anger that God pours out in the lake of fire is not, um, it's punishment. It's not um, uh, rehabilitation. It's not that. This is punishment. Now watch. For the believer, like here, we are never punished for our sin. The believer. We're never punished. What are we? Discipline. What's the difference between discipline and punishment? Discipline, reform, rehabilitation, right? Lack of a better term. Um, what did you say? Growth. Growth. Yeah. So, so God in love disciplines us because as a point, it's, it's growing in us something that wasn't there before. But, and that's not punishment. Punishment is just there's going to be swift justice upon you not to rehabilitate you. This is what it deserves. So that's what the lake of fire is. Yeah, so there's no, and that's like that idea what you had just said, that's like that love wins deal, right? So enough punishment, the heart will change. But let's not forget the heart only changes if the spirit gives the new heart. Yeah. All right. Questions, um, keep them till later. Let's go to page 121. Let's move into the new heavens and the new earth. Let's end on a glorious, bright note for the believer. The new heavens and the new earth. Verse 1 of chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Praise the Lord. Right? 
Now, I understand this as a renovation of this earth in which we live, a renovation. So what I do not see taking place is I do not see this planet exploding into a billion pieces and God recreating the planet. What I see is there's going to be a renovation of this planet. Now, when you get to the like nitty gritty of the whole thing, it doesn't really matter because there's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a new earth, okay? It's just kind of like one of those fun things to think about. But I think it's a renovation of the first heavens and the first earth, okay? Now, here's why. Here's why. I just give you some reasons. What follows is not total destruction, but again, renovation. Here's why. The word new there, I saw a new heaven. Word new means new in character, not new in substance. So new in character, not new in substance. So... This is the same word used of the believer in 2 Corinthians 5.17 in uh, reference to the regenerated um, believer. So, uh, you know the verse, right? We are what kind of creatures? New creatures, right? New creatures in Christ. So, will is still will. Same substance, but uh, but it's new, right? New. Uh, Same thing, like we're, we're still who we are. Right, but we're new. We're, we're now in Christ. So new in character, not new in substance. The word changed, the word changed in Hebrews 1. So look at Hebrews 1 just for a second. Hebrews 1, 12. Like a mantle, you will roll them up like a garment. Uh, they will also be changed. Right, that word changed, again, talking about the heavens the word change in Hebrews 1.12 is used for the changing of the believer at glorification. So you're still you. Your body is resurrected. It will be glorified, but it's resurrected. So you're still you, only in the glorified state. Same thing. This earth, new heavens, new earth, the, the, the earth, the heavens that are, that are changed there, it's still the heavens and the earth. But something happened to that substance. Uh, Enns writes this, the believer retains his identity, although he receives a glorified body. We've looked at that. The earth remains earth, though it is renovated and cleansed and becomes a new earth. The analogy is important. As a believer is changed, receiving a glorified body, so the earth is changed into a new earth, unstained by sin. So we are still us with no sin. Now this earth is still this earth, but without a curse and without sin. Now notice the example Peter uses. I give you the whole passage there. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. The idea is that if it never happened before, it will never happen in the future, right? And we know that is never true. (laughs) Um, The problem here, though, is it did happen in the past. So the whole argument is turned on its head because God did judge. They're saying he never did. For, verse 5, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So God did destroy this earth, right? He did destroy the earth. Now, let me ask you, that word destroy there, does that mean exploding the earth and something new coming or does that mean renovating? It's renovating. So that's going to be the contrast that, that Peter is, is using. So the flood is one side of it. Now watch, verse 7. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now there are commentators that say, see, uh, you have the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, which means that the atoms are going to be split apart. There's going to be this atomic explosion. And so the earth is just going to, again, explode. 
And you say, well, that makes sense. Here's the problem. Authorial intent. Remember that from way back? What does the author mean when he writes? Here's my question to you. Did Peter, when he wrote this, have in mind the Adams? No. He didn't. So you can't interpret that as, look, the atom's going to be torn apart and again, it's going to be exploded. What he's just simply saying is judgment is coming and just like the flood takes care of everything, now fire is going to come and take care of everything. Judgment. And notice, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Just like the, it was flooded, it will be burned. And burned throughout uh, the scripture has... Um, it can have that judgment idea. It can have that like renovating. Since all these things are to be destroyed. So just because it says destroyed doesn't mean leave existence. The flood destroyed the earth. It didn't leave, the earth didn't leave existence. All right, so that's the example that Peter uses. So, um, so I see this as renovation, the, the fire renovating, not as you see in the notes, a disintegration of of this planet. Second Peter 3.10 can emphasize divine cleansing, uh, again, rather than annihilation. So there's a cleansing taking place. So Talbot writes this, page 122. The new earth will emerge from the baptism of judicial fire. Just using that flood imagery. Clean, beautiful, holy. Every stain of sin, every mark of evil will be wiped out. The condition of the earth as it was according to the record of Genesis 1-1 will be restored with a plus, right? What's the plus? You, it's just, it's, it's now really glorified. All right, next, another reason why I see this as renovation, not disintegration, is because the earth is groaning for a renovation. It's not groaning to be destroyed, all right, so that's Romans 3. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. It's, it's hyperbole. It's, it's taking a look at the fall, how the fall actually affected the planets. I mean, every earthquake that we see, um, every tornado, right? You can see that this is a groaning, that something has happened to this planet. And so what he's saying just simply here is, um, again, hyperbole. The creation is groaning, again, not to be exploded. It's groaning to be restored. And I would add just a theological reason. I think it's better to understand God renovating the earth rather than annihilating it. And one theological reason here is because if God has to completely destroy this planet, then in a way, Satan actually did something to God's plan that God now has to completely redo, recreate. So ends right, Satan did not create the earth very good, um, should be God, <laughs> did not create the earth very good, only to have Satan lead men in rebellion against God, causing God to destroy the world. Were that the case, Satan could claim a victory. Does that claim one victory? I took the earth from God. Grudem, it is difficult to think that God would entirely annihilate his original creation, thereby seeming to give the devil um, the last words and scrapping the creation that was originally very good. What you see, look at, um, look at chapter 21. Well, look at chapter 22. Look at chapter 22. What do we see here? Um, verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side was the what? Tree of life. Drop down to verse 3. There will no longer be any curse. Uh, his bond servants will serve him continually, unlike Adam and Eve who uh, served God but then rejected God. We will serve him continually, just like Adam and Eve did. They will see his face 
And so you have in the new heavens and new earth, you have a return to Eden. A return to Eden. But again, just theologically, if God has to explode everything and redo it, again, as Grudem says, or as uh, N says, is that now Satan claiming at least some victory? All right, so those are some of those reasons for renovation rather than exploding the earth altogether. Any questions on that, though? Yeah. So the first question, are there going to be seasons, right? And uh, you have um, the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So perhaps, maybe, maybe it's just the climate that, it's going to be perfect, whatever it is. There's going to be passing of time. There's going to be certain, even here, fruit that comes at certain times. Now, were the seasons a part of, um, uh, that came after the flood, Right, and that's not promise. You know, there will be those seasons. If, if it came after the flood, well, that's more of a sign of, of uh, judgment, right? Faithfulness of God to continue it. Uh, but whatever we see in the new heavens, the new earth, it's going to be absolute perfection. And there's not going to be like the cold climate for those who didn't get a lot of rewards. You know, and they're like, you go to Antarctica. You know, not that. Yeah, so there's no punishment there. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably not going to be any clouds from, uh, you know, September through July. Yeah. Yeah, so, so notice, um, and we're going to get there, the sun and the moon. Um, you have, cry, uh, you have um, Christ illuminating everything. Right, so there's no need for that sun. I mean, he's just illuminating. Um, I was just joking. I was just kind of like this silly things that we're talking about at staff meeting this past week. Um, but one thing that we say when the sun comes out is, um, life is better when the sun's out, right? And I was just thinking about that and then reading where it says that Christ is going to illuminate, right? That's why, I, I mean, it's true. Life is better when there's light. And in glory, it's, just, it's going to be coming from Christ. He's the lamp that illuminates the new Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. So in the millennium, uh, how is the new heavens, new earth um, different than the millennium? So, and then we might, we might get there maybe, but in the millennium, there will be sin. Um, in the new heavens and the new earth, there will not be any sin. Now, there's, there is continuity. There is some continuity between the millennial kingdom and the new heavens and new earth, so much so that Isaiah in Isaiah 66, 65, can say this is the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be new. So there is continuity uh, between the two. Uh, you even have the continuity of rulership. So, so Christ then is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, Zion, right? I'll set my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So Christ is ruling from, from Jerusalem. Well, what does he do in the new heavens and new earth? He turns over his kingdom to his father, and so now they're both ruling. So there's, there's still a kingdom, there's still a rule uh, there. But the main thing is that the curse is completely removed. Um, sin is no longer, I'm going to tell you what's not in the new heavens, new earth. And um, yeah, and the, 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 curse is, the curse is gone. Yeah, completely. So there is continuity. But the, but the uh, millennial kingdom is there before this complete renovation. So you could even say, and I haven't really thought this out all that much, but you could even say even during that millennium, there still might be that groaning, right, for that full renovation. Um, there. Yeah, done. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the tribulation is part of that. I just know that, um, uh, that you have in, in verse 21, there comes a point, there comes a point where there is that break now um, from, from Christ's rule in the millennium, turning it over to the Father. And then you have even that change. I saw verse 2 of chapter 21. I saw the holy city, um, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. So 
there's another change, Chuck, that you have um, a new Jerusalem coming. Christ is reigning in the old Jerusalem. Millennial came, now there's a new Jerusalem. Yeah, coming down from that. So there is that, that shift, but that is after. Yeah. There's going to be a, there is going to be geological changes in the millennial kingdom. I think we looked at that last week. There will be geological changes, but not to the extent, obviously, of, of the new heavens, new earth. Uh, look at your notes, page 122. There's continuity with the old earth. The fact that John calls it an earth, again, this is still renovation rather than um, explosion. The fact that John calls it an earth shows that there is some continuity. It doesn't call it a different planet. Um, Alcorn says earth will be redeemed and resurrected. In the end, it will be a far greater world. It will preserve and perpetuate earth's original design and heritage. So you can see, you can see theologically where these guys are going, that this is Eden restored. Same earth, Eden restored. It'll preserve and perpetuate earth's original design. Uh, now, notice the discontinuity, though. There is discontinuity with the old earth. Okay, so it's kind of uh, gets into the question that was just asked. So note the following reasons. And if you don't agree with these reasons, you can call the master's seminary. And you can ask for Dr. Nathan Buznitz. And you can say, I don't like what you said. So don't blame me. I'm just the, just the messenger. These are... <laughs> Don't tell him I sent you. Um, so these are taken from an article that, that he wrote. First of all, first of all, this is what's not uh, in uh, the new heavens and new earth. There is no sea. There's no sea. Now, there's a debate here of what this means. Okay, there's a debate. So notice in scripture, the sea is often representative of evil, disorder, and chaos. Moreover, the ocean as we know it today is a result of God's judgment in the flood. But all signs of evil and judgment will be gone in the new earth. So, the question is, is there no sea in the sense of like physical sea? Or is there no sea in the sense of, is this a picture of the chaos and evil? Okay, so, turn back to, I uh, turn back to chapter 13, Revelation 13. So this, this is an interpretive, interpretive deal. Chapter 13, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns. And so you have now this, the, the beast coming out of the, it's off out of the chaos. It's out of the evil. So the question then is, Revelation 21, is that using the idea of sea, in the same sense. There's no more evil. Right? There's no more disorder. There's no more chaos. So that's the question. I'm not going to answer that tonight because I have to figure it out. And I have to figure it out before I preach Revelation 21. But the way I go, I have like 13 years before I have to figure that one out. By the way, I'm trying to get through John 21 in four sermons. Yeah, good luck. I know. <laughs> Jerry's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Try and force sermons, but we'll see what happens. Okay, number two. There will no longer be any separation between God and man. No longer any separation between God and man. Look at verses two and three. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle. So the dwelling place, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them. And they shall be as people and God himself will be among them. Do you see the emphasis? He will dwell among them. Um, uh, God is among them. He will dwell among them. God himself will be among them. So there's no more separation. Uh, this does go back to uh, Genesis. Go back to Genesis uh, 3. Genesis 3. In verse 8. 
They heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So they were with God. So God was among them. Uh, that is not God the Father and that is not the Holy Spirit. Spirits do not walk. So that is a pre-incarnate Christ. Okay, so that's the Son. That's the Son of God there walking in the garden in the cool of the day. When you think about it that way, when you think that this is Christ uh, walking and communing uh, with them, uh, doesn't it become amazing in verse 14 when the Lord God said to the serpents, he curses the serpents, and then, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. That is a pre-incarnate Christ announcing his own cross, what he will do. And so no longer, it goes back to Genesis, no longer is there any separation between God and man. Turn the page. There is no more tears or crying. That's verse 4. You will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. Right? No tears, no mourning, no crying. MacArthur writes, Heaven is a realm of unsurpassed joy, unfading glory, undiminished bliss, unlimited delights, and unending pleasures. It will be perfect existence. We will have unbroken fellowship with all heaven's inhabitants. Life there will be devoid of any sorrows, cares, tears, fears, or pain. It's all gone. Edwards, then God will have obtained the end of all his great works that he had been doing from the beginning. Then all the deep designs of God will be unfolded in their events. Then the wisdom of his marvelous contrivances in his hidden, intricate, and inexplicable, uh, inexplicable works will appear. The ends being obtained. Then God's glory will more abundantly appear in his works. His works being perfect. This will cause a great accession of happiness to the saints who behold it. This is the same guy who wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards loved to preach about heaven. He loved to. This is part of it. So you have just a growing of happiness. Then God will fully have glorified himself and glorified his son and his elect. Then he will see that all is very good. Does that not go back to Genesis 1 and 2? And will rejoice in his work, which will be the joy of heaven. Unending joy, no tears, no mourning, no crying. Verse 4, there's no pain. There's no pain. Again, verse 4, we just read it. There will no longer be any death. No death, keep going in verse 4. Again, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Verse 6, uh, rather verse 5, there's nothing that will be, that will not be made new. He who sits on the throne said, behold, I'm making some of these things new. No, I'm making all things new. So everything is better. Verse 6, there's no spiritual thirst. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. No spiritual thirst. Complete satisfaction. Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There will not be any unredeemed sinner. Okay, so this is new heavens, new earth. No unredeemed sinner, no unbelievers. So look at verse 8. But the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murders and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so this is, these are characteristics that describe people. Okay, so a believer, a believer is a new creature. A believer has been given the Holy Spirit, a new heart, new uh, loves and longings. Uh, a believer will be sanctified, and so a believer will repent. So a believer is not characterized by these things. First um, John says we do not continue without uh, breaks and repentance. We don't continue in sin. So here, this is what characterizes uh, these people, these are the unredeemed, these are the unbelievers, but they're not there. Number nine, there's no temple. There's no temple. 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife, the lamb. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain. I'm trying to see where that was from. Oh, verse 22, sorry, verse 22. Um, I saw no temple in it. New heavens, this is New Jerusalem, New Heavens, New Earth. I saw no temple in it for the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So the temple is where God dwells, but there's no temple because God dwells where? Everywhere. Uh, look at verse 23. The question was asked before about the sun and the moon. There's no need for the sun and the moon, verse 23. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. This again, New Jerusalem, for the glory of God has illumined it and the lamp is the lamb. So it's just going to be, I mean, think of the Mount of Transfiguration, just like on steroids. And just, just, it's just um, shining. So you don't need a sun or a moon. You don't need a lamp. And I see the same thing in chapter 22. Look at 22, verse 5. There will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. And they will reign forever and ever. And again, that's just interesting. The Lord God will illumine them. You go back to 21.3, that the lamp is the lamb. So the one who's illuminating is the lamb. He is the Lord God. Look at verse 25. Uh, there is no need to close the gates in the new Jerusalem. Verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. Why do you close gates? Why do you close gates in a kingdom? protection. There's no need. There's no need. Well, part of the reason, or really all of the reason, is verse 8, uh, because all unbelievers are in the lake of fire. Verse 27, there's nothing unclean. Nothing unclean there. No one's name who's not written in the book of life, Lamb's book of life. Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, verse 3, there is no curse, no longer any curse. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. All right, so that is what is not, what is not in the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be glorious existence. So different, so different. So needed. All right, questions. Questions on that? Not that it matters, but Bob, since you're asking, it does matter. Don't say it doesn't matter. It's kind of a, a, a ridiculous question anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are glad you are asking the question that doesn't matter and is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. We're ending on a strong note. What happens to Pluto and Mars? Well, first of all, Pluto's not a planet. I mean, Pluto already got the boot, right? right? So sorry, Pluto. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what happens to the universe, right? Uh, yeah, and again, we're not, it's, it's new. So, so you have new heavens, new earth. So the new heaven is not where God dwells. It's not like where God dwells now, heaven, that that needs to be renovated. New heaven is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's going to be a renovation that takes place. Ren uh, heavens being the sky, the, um, the solar system. So there will be some renovation. We're not told, though. We're not told, yeah. I know. You're right. It was a ridiculous question. Yeah. <laughs> you did waste our time. I mean, it will be, well, not anymore. I will not be calling on you after this. No? Yeah, check. Of which chapter? Verse 9? Which chapter? 20, 21, okay. Yeah, so uh, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, it was verse 9, 21, 9, um, full of the last plague, said, uh, come here, I will show you the bride of the wife of the lamb. Verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Um, and then that, that is called the bride, if you can kind of continue down. So this is, this is like that reunion God's people. So we're, we're now with our Savior. We're now with our God. 
And it's just, there's no, the intimacy is there. Uh, the, the bride is the city, isn't it? I have to look, I have to keep reading. Yeah. We'll probably keep reading and we'll figure something out. Okay. Yeah, so there it is, verse 11. Uh, her brilliance was like very costly stones. So the bride's brilliant. So it is the new Jerusalem. The bride is the new, but the new Jerusalem is filled with people. So again, it's the, the reunion of God's people with, with, um, with their savior, with their, with their husband. It's, that, it, it's meant to show that intimacy and that love. It'll never be broken and it'll be forever and ever and ever. And I would say even just like, uh, just like hell, sin grows, I think that intimacy and that love, like we, we it's one reason why eternity is eternity because we're gonna keep experiencing this even to greater degrees. And, and, and God is infinite and he's eternal. And so his love is infinite and it's eternal. And so we're just going to keep experiencing that. It only gets better. It's not to say that it's bad to start, but just because God is eternal and we are created, again, it's going to be experiencing that to even greater degrees. I mean, it's, I, I think about the Old Testament. I mean, it's just unimaginable, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, well, that's one of the thoughts. You know, we, there's no sea because we need all the land. Well, when you start seeing what God can do with the new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles up, 1,500 miles, I think he can kind of work that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there will be sushi. If anybody's wondering, right, just read John 21. Jesus made fish and ate it. Anybody like sushi here? You will. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Rebecca. No, no, I was, I couldn't see who it was. Yeah, the question comes up, you know, what is the spirit doing? for eternity right, what's the spirit doing well but, <laughs> yeah so the spirit's role is always to point to christ so so the it's the spirit pointing to christ who then glorifies the father right so that's what the spirit's doing there's still however the spirit works in this way is going to bring, bring glory to christ who then brings glory to the father yep again we're not told the specifics yeah. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, in my father's house are many dwelling places. Um, in John 14, 2. How literally do you take that? How literal? So... I think what Jesus is doing there is he is drawing off of the, the, um, the bride and bridegroom um, imagery. So I go away to prepare a place, right, um, to, for you, but I'm going to come back to you. So it seems kind of like a parable there. Uh, that's, that's the thing that he's saying. I'm going to be going. Do not let your heart be troubled. I'm going. But that's what a, a groom can tell his bride. Do not let your heart be troubled because I'm going to do something for you. And don't fear I'm coming back to you. So that seems to be, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as like the, the literalistic way. I think there's a, it's that imagery of, imagery of bride, bridegroom bride. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at what are the characteristics of the new heavens and the new earth. Page 123. It's filled with the glory of God. Filled with the glory of God. We've read that. Revelation 21. And note Isaiah 60. It will be like Eden. It will be like Eden. Just think of Isaiah 51. Indeed, the Lord will comfort for all places. Wilderness will keep like Eden. 
and are desert like the of the Lord, and gladness will be her thanksgiving, sound gone, the truth is there again, Eden restored. It's Eden restored. Um, it will have nations and governments. Okay, nations and governments. The nations will walk by its light, Revelation 21. Kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. They'll worship. They're going to um, most likely bring the best of, of what they're producing, the best of who they have, bring in as worship. So the nations, there are things. The capital of the new heaven and the new earth is the new Jerusalem. That's the capital. Galatians calls it the Jerusalem above, right? So it's going to come from heaven. Uh, there now. 12 calls it the heavenly Jerusalem. But now you're going to have the heavenly Jerusalem that we can't see. Right now come down, it will be now physical. Revelation 21, you do get the, the picture. I think I give you all the verses. Let's just read it and, uh, and just kind of see what, what takes place. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a hot, great high wall with 12 gates and at the gate 12 angels, names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Uh, God's not done with Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on the names of apostles of the Lamb. The one who had spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gate and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length as the width. And he measured the city with a rod, 100 miles, its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall seven yards according to human measurements. I love that. Let me have one of those long measuring which are in measurements. So apparently they have the same ruler, right? This, it's in yards. So that's American measurements. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. Not the metric system in heaven. Uh, and the city of pure gold Verse 19, the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was Jasper, the second sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth uh, Sardius, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth well, again, just the first one and the twelfth of pearl. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. So when we th just kind of put this in perspective, how silly is it for us to, to worship money like today in order to worship um, gold and silver? How silly is that? You put in the big scheme, uh, one door in the new heavens is a gigantic pearl. That's just so silly, right? We, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to worship our bit. And people are like, we have no idea what Bitcoin is. You know, but it's worth something. Like we're worshiping these, these, these miserly things when you put it all in perspective. But this is our inheritance. This is where we'll live. Uh, verse, 20, verse 21, 12 gates were 12 pearls. Uh, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it for God. The Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, verse 23. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, verse 24. The nations will walk in its light, verse 25. In the daytime, its gates will never be closed, safety. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it and nothing. So just imagine how it's like the collection of everything that the nations are producing. It's a collection of all of it. Nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination or lying will be in its. Special note, the fact that this city comes down out of heaven indicates that this city already exists right now in heaven. Already exists. So, by the way, let, Greg, let me go back to your question. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, you have to think back a decade ago when I preached John 14. Jesus is not saying, I'm, go, uh, I'm, I'm going to like build something. 
So, um, you know, it's not like he's, he's working on it now uh, so that, you know, when it's finally ready, then it happens. That's not the point. When he says, I go to prepare a place for you, the I go there is actually not going to heaven. He's going to the cross. So I'm leaving you. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm leaving you. I'm going to the cross. Why? To prepare a place for you, to prepare you to enter into heaven. So that's the point of that. So it's not he's going to heaven to prepare something for us. It's not like he's, you know, taking his carpenter hammer. He's going to the cross, a better way to think about it, he's going to the cross to prepare us for that place, to die for us. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you. As we speak, and it's done. It's just, I come down eventually of heaven, but all of heaven is currently okay, all of heaven is currently in the New Jerusalem. It is separate from the present universe, which is tainted by sin. Believers who die go to the heavenly Jerusalem where Jesus has gone before them to prepare a place for them. So I would just have an issue with that. I don't think he's going to heaven to prepare. I think he went to the cross to prepare us for it. All right, but it comes down out of heaven, indicating that the new Jerusalem is there right now. Right now. Now, what are the symbols? What are the symbols within this new heaven and the new earth? All right, number one, we have the beauty of God's glory. Beauty of God's glory. Revelation 21, 11. Having the glory of God. Okay, so we have the glory of God, the, sh the, the, the shining brilliance of every perfection of God. So God's glory manifests itself in light, pure light. And then you have this statement. Her brilliance was like very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. So this is that symbol. So it's the glory of God and all he can, all he can say is the glory of God is shining throughout. So it's just, it's just radiant light and, and pure light, crystal clear, pure light that's just radiating throughout. Turn to the page. The city looks like a great diamond, a great diamond coming out of the sky. There's going to be peace and safety. We have already looked at that, the high walls, the gates, but the gates are never closed. We have constant reminders of divine grace and mercy. Con we will never forget why we are in the new heavens and new earth. We'll never forget. One, the lamb is shining. Who's that? Christ. And why is he referred to as the lamb? What did he do? He sacrificed. So we're always going to remember that there's a lamb. Why we're there. But Revelation 21, 12, 12 gates. Names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Each gate will be a reminder of God's covenant love. So every time you pass through, that's God's covenant love for his people, his people Israel. Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So each stone is a reminder of God's gracious choice of the church. Very particular. We have a picture of sovereign rule, a symbol of sovereign rule. We have in chapter 22, verse 1, we have the throne of God and of the Lamb. That is sovereignty. God is still king. He will always be king. We have perfect existence. <clears throat> perfect existence. Uh, 22.2, on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. So look at MacArthur. At first glance, that seems confusing, since obviously there will be no illness or injury in heaven that would require healing. So that word he healing there, however, does not imply illness. Perhaps a better way to translate it would be life-giving or health-giving or therapeutic. The leaves of the tree can be likened to supernatural vitamins. Maybe, since vitamins are not taken to treat illness, to promote health in general, life in heaven will be fully energized, rich, and exciting. That's how he interprets that. Now, hold on to your seats here just for a second, okay? Hold on to your seats. 
one of my um, favorite professors in seminary. His name's Robert Thomas. He has two very uh, thick commentaries on the book of Revelation. And he actually, he actually interprets Revelation 22 too, about um, the healing of the nations and the leaves. He interprets that. I'm not saying I hold to this. I'm just giving you another interpretation. He says that those... Um, believers who make it through the millennial kingdom, right, millennial kingdom, they're not glorified. So the believers that make it through, they're not glorified, just like, um, um, just like you have the, the non-glorified entering into the millennial kingdom. Those who are at the end of the millennial kingdom, non-glorified, they then enter in a non-glorified state into the new heavens and the new earth. The only reason why they can exist forever and ever is because they or a representative of them must then in their due course, their due time, go to the new Jerusalem and eat the tree of life that gives health. And that's why they then can last and live forever and ever. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Now, Robert Thomas, he passed away, so he's in heaven. So he knows if he's right or wrong right now. Okay, he knows. But that is another way to interpret Revelation 22 too. Now, now, that interpretation, again, it kind of sounds a little strange, but there is an interpretation of Genesis um, 2 that, that Adam and Eve continually had to eat um, of the tree of life to maintain their existence. So that would kind of correlate between those. But I just want to throw it out there. That's why I said hold on to your seats. Okay, yeah. That comment reminded me of Bob's question over there. Um, <laughs> There will be, there'll also be a curse-free, a curse-free existence. 22.3 goes back to um, Eden. There will no longer be any curse. Perfect service. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Bond servants will serve him. We'll finally do what we, in perfection, do what we've been created to do. We'll have perfect relationship. We will see his face. His name will be on our foreheads. All right, so here's Robert Thomas. He writes this. After Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God. So you can see the correlation. Okay, so what was lost at Eden is restored in Revelation 22. Um, after Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God. God did not allow Moses to view his face. But Jesus promised the privilege to the pure in heart, right? They will see God. It is possible only for those who are righteous and holy to view God directly. Viewing the glory of God is a limited privilege in the here and now, but barriers will disappear when the redeemed enter the bride city. We will see God. What was lost in Eden is restored. What's the shape? The shape of the new Jerusalem. The city is laid out as a square. So it's a cube. Morris writes, the language of the passage being much more naturally understood to mean a cube. Again, not a square, but up, down, left, right. You have a picture of it? I mean, not an actual picture. So you have that there, the cube. The size gives you some perspective. He measured the city. This is just the New Jerusalem. He measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. So 1,500 miles um, there, east, right, west, north, south. Um, that's... That's over half of the United States. That's in, all right, so that's the city. If you take a look, turn the page to 130. Uh, you take a look at Israel today, right? So that's in the darkened little oblong deal. Uh, Israel today. And then you take a look at the square there that represents the new Jerusalem. What's coming? Ultimately, it's 1.9 million square miles. McLean writes, it is true that this concept will be totally out of proportion with the dimensions of our present earth, but there is to be a new earth. So that though, I think that you can have it kind of going up. You can, you can have God create this whole deal. Again, this is part of that renovation of what needs to take place. All right, so that is the new Jerusalem that is the new heavens, the new earth. And guess what? That is our home. 
That's where we will live forever and ever. And it should, the more we long for that, should weaken our clinging and our grasp to the things of this fallen world. Because everything is better, greater. And the greatest thing about the millennial kingdom and the new heavens and the new earth, the greatest thing is that our God is there and we will be in his presence. So if you are longing for the streets of gold, if you're longing for like, I just really need to see those pearls. I love pearls. I have pearls. I want to see the pearls. Okay. The greatest thing is that Christ is there. And so I would just, this is my evangelistic appeal, uh, appeal at this point. I would ask you, do you actually long for Christ? Do you love Christ here? Because listen, if you don't love Christ now, heaven is the worst place for you, right? Because that's where Christ is. And that's why one of those marks of, one of those marks of true salvation is that you have a love for Christ. You cherish him. And that is what ultimately we long for. That is the end of the notes. Any questions out there? Look at that, right on time. It's like I've done this before. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Charla has been very quiet for weeks. Have you just been like, just waiting for this moment? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, where's the lake of fire? So I would, I, this is my conjecture, just like the, I would, I would say it's, it would be in the same realm as the new Jerusalem right now. So we don't see the new Jerusalem right now, right? So the same kind of like realm. Um, every time that hell is referred to, it's always down. Every time heaven is referred to, it's always up. I'm, I don't know, you know, how you work that out just because, again, it's in a different realm, yeah, so that's how I would answer that. Again, we're not, we're not told. Yeah. We're in the new Jerusalem. Yeah, so we don't, so we don't, we don't see it. No, nope. we don't see it. Um, uh, again, God's, we are only experiencing God's blessing and, and love and, and care, yeah. No. What else? Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. Say what? No yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's that's where Noah has seen. Uh, I mean, it's we can't comprehend what God dwelling on this earth un, unhindered would even be like. Uh, that's why um, that's why C.S. Lewis. It's that it's that famous quote. You know, today um, we are so satisfied with just kind of making mud pies in the sand. You know, we, we like stuff and, and we find our, our joy in things and yet the world is passing away. It's just these mud pies. The, the greatest, the, the most expensive car that you can buy, the, the biggest house, the palace, Taj Mahal, right? You have the greatest palace there. That is a mud pie compared to what? New heavens, new earth. Even millennial kingdom, but new heavens, new earth. And not because... The new heavens and new earth is just more beautiful, which it is. It's because God is there. We're in his presence, and your presence is fullness of joy. What else? Yeah. What's the condition of the earth during the millennial kingdom? Yeah, condition of the earth during the millennial kingdom. Good question. There, I, I, it is going to be renovated to a degree. So I think that's part of that continuity between millennial and new heavens and new earth. So it's renovated to a degree. So part of that renovation um, is going to be uh, at the, through the tribulation. So that's part of the renovation. But Christ then is going to um, continue or finalize that first renovation. He's going to finalize that in the sense of Israel now becomes the, the, the land of milk and honey. Israel now becomes... Trees and rivers. And uh, you, you see it in um, Zechariah, Zechariah 14, where, yeah, for 13, 14, where Christ comes down and the mountain splits. And now all of a sudden a river flows um, into the Dead Sea. And now people are, are, are fishing in the Dead Sea. 
Well, Dead Sea is, is dead. That's why they call it Dead Sea. Uh, nothing lives there. But now there's going to be life. So, so the millennial kingdom is going to have a renovation through the judgments and through Christ's return. And it seems like Christ would then finalize that. But yeah, there's a, there's a drastic change in the millennial kingdom. Drastic. Yeah. All right, what else? Yes, my dear. Is there any indication that people will be living outside of the New Jerusalem? Yeah. Yeah, so any indication of people living outside the New Jerusalem? And that's where I think it re- references uh, nations. Nations. So, yeah, so the whole earth will be inhabited, right? So there will be nations, there are government. Um, so, who's in the New Jerusalem? You can study that and get back to us. Um, What's that? When the river runs out of uh, underground, yeah. is that in the New Jerusalem or is that in the millennium? No, uh, that's New Jerusalem. That's twenty-two-one. Show me the river of the water of life. Yep, throne of God. You're going to ask, where does the river go? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know where the river goes. It might just keep going around like a, like a lazy river. <laughs> yeah, I got to I got to study that. Yeah, I'll but I'll get back to you at home when you can ask any question that you want, not in front of people. That was a good question. That was a good question. We've been married for we've been married for 23 years. We'll be married for 24 years. <laughs> They're clapping for you, for you, <laughs> like you've made it, like how in the world? Um, but we have known each other our entire life. Yeah, we grew up together yeah, our entire life. We have no new stories, literally no new stories. We've heard them all. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Every story is new to Sarah now, but... We're just saying, the other, it was just like yesterday. You're like, I, for, I don't think I've ever seen that movie. I'm like, honey, you've seen it three times. You know. <laughs> anyway, so another question. Is that Janet? Yeah. Hey, Janet. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you say that louder for everybody to? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're welcome. I, my, it is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. Love, love doing it. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me pray and we will be done. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the months uh, that we have looked through uh, what is in store. And uh, Lord, I thank you that we have a resurrected body that will be ours. And I thank you that we will see our Savior face to face forever and ever and we will be satisfied. Uh, It is the longing of our heart. And I pray that that hope will instill in us um, a greater longing to be with you that we would follow Colossians 3, that we would set our minds on the things above, where Christ is. That is our home. Uh, we look forward to being there. And, and when we live in light of that, not only may our love for you grow, but may our desire to express your gospel with unbelievers grow as well. Let us not be satisfied with just knowing that this is our home. Um, But let us have that longing to tell unbelievers this truth and pray that your spirit would change their hearts and draw them to yourself. Pray, Father, that you would uh, bring us back on Sunday uh, safe, that we would be ready to uh, corporately bring glory and honor to your name. We pray all this in Christ. Amen. All right. So no class next week. Uh, We will uh, pick up class at some point in the future. But... um, but be, uh, have your eyes and ears open for that. But it's not anytime, not anytime soon. Some months. September, I'm going on my sabbatical. So unless you want to go with me. Yeah, yeah. So my sabbatical starts September 15th. September 15th, it goes through December 15th. Remember that. Yep, yep, so. <laughs> who, remember, who remember that? I'm remembering that. <laughs> Sarah's not letting me forget that. Yeah. We have one of those um, um, construction paper chains. We like pull it off each time. (laughs) Yeah, it's like Christmas. Yeah, anyway. All right, have a great night. We'll see you on Sunday.